Hello, everyone. It's exciting to be here. I bring you greetings uh, to all of you from our membership at Local 88. And uh, although you've been given a little bit of background about our local, I will just continue with that a little bit more. Our employer is Cami Automotive in Ingersoll, Ontario, in Canada, which is 50% owned by Suzuki Japan and 50% owned by General Motors. We're a living experiment to both Canadian Auto Workers Union and to General Motors. From General Motors' perspective, they wanted to learn through a living plant the ins and outs of the Japanese production system, or what a lot of us call lean production. And of course, to make a good profit doing it. From the union's perspective, they wanted to see if a good union culture could be created in this environment of lean production. The hiring process was arduous and specifically looked for potential production associates that had no union background and oddly enough, no experience whatsoever in industry or manufacturing. The other important thing to note is that in the advertising of these jobs, which was back in 1988-89, Cammy said that this was going to be a different place to work, the kissy face stuff. <laughs> the production associates would have input in their jobs, that the company thrived on, on open communications, blah, blah, blah. In this hiring, many people had just finished university and college. They were hired. A lot of small business people, uh, just from our rural location, a lot of small farmers and civil service workers. All of these people had been really hard hit in the 81 and 80, uh, to 83 recession in Canada. So the expectations of those being hired were quite high and further reinforced by a two week, what they call Nagari training. It's what we call indoctrination. The learning curve varied a bit from member to member and from team to team, but it didn't take very long to figure out that we had been duped. This was no workplace utopia. To quote our first union president, Rob Pelche, Cami had hired bright people and then demanded that they not be bright. Our first collective agreement outlined a basic uh, grievance procedure, union representation as it existed at that point, layoff, recall, hours of work, union security, recognition, all that stuff. And all the rest of the stuff, I just love the term, was all kissy face stuff. We had to mutually agree to do everything else. Well, as you can well imagine, mutually agreeing to doing things ran into a few snags. The union would request things to assist workers and the company would simply say no. Our 1992 uh, was our first real kick at real genuine collective bargaining and most of the important issues were around dignity and respect in the workplace and working conditions our members went out on strike for five weeks and won a good number of crucial demands the strike matured us as uh, a local union membership it was our first real time that we had flexed our muscles and came out with a distinct win just as importantly we met each other in a different context on the picket line with time to talk to each other and meet new members from other departments, other shifts, and the car side of the, the plant met the truck side of the plant. This was very important. We began to recognize ourselves as a collective force in the workplace. During these formative years, a local university labor studies group and our national union did an extensive survey on our members and their reactions to lean production. The results of this study further reinforced what we were learning as a local union, that we could find ways to fight back in a lean production environment, and that fighting back made a huge difference in the lives of our members in, on, in the workplace. Some of our first floor fight backs, and please don't laugh, we had to start at scratch with nothing, <laughs> was uh, be able to get picnic tables to sit at for our rest areas. The simple thing, the simple right to bring a newspaper, your own newspaper, into your rest area to read. Struggles about the mandatory uniform that we wear, the rights to wear poppies on our collars at Remembrance Day, the right to wear Walkmans as radios were not allowed in the plant, and the right to wear ball caps instead of the goofy company hats that we had to wear. Somewhere along the line though, the local lost its way somewhat. Union democracy was declining to an either you're with us or you're against us mentality. 
Activism began to be viewed with suspicion. It was something to keep in check. The strength of the floor, the knowledge of rank and file members was reduced to what I call tap on and tap off solidarity. That means when the leadership want, they turn on the solidarity tap. And when they're done, the leadership turns off the tap. And then they tell the membership when it's needed by them in the future. During this time, we lost a lot of ground. Members on the floor no longer trusted what they knew and how to get things done and waited for the leadership to tell them how and when to express solidarity. It was particularly hard on the activists of the local who were exploding with possibilities and the many things that they were learning but not able to implement in the local. We lost a number, a good number of activists during this time and activists had to be almost masochistic to continue. Despite these challenges, our local standing committees such as education, women's human rights, our flying squad, communications, etc., kept learning and doing things in the community at the regional uh, level of our union and at the national level where they felt uh, more welcome. We started a reading circle to continue our education on progressive ideas about social justice, about politics, leadership, globalization, free trade agreements, etc. Our newsletter was an important tool during this time for exchanging ideas and reading about what was happening in the local. We also ordered and circulated our bundle of labor notes to anyone that found it interesting. Both our labor notes and our newsletter are still an important communication tool uh, for the membership to this day. None of us can really pinpoint when it happened, but we started to come together and began to work on changing the local. We realized that this work was not just about grabbing power, but being able to articulate our shared vision of what our local could be. More democratic, more diverse, more inclusive, more welcoming, and to facilitate the work of activists for the betterment of our local, our members, and our community. To educate, 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 and to listen, to genuinely listen to our coworkers' concerns and facilitate them in taking action and trusting their instincts. We're celebrating some of our victories. In the last election, we made significant headway in certain areas and not so much in other areas. We have much yet to do. We recognize that we are in this for the long haul, which includes the generation of union leadership coming right behind us. To create them a space to get union education and experience at a young age. To incorporate their younger ideas, their communication methods, and most of all, their energy. We learned that we had to be ready for opportunities that arose. The importance of timing cannot be underestimated, so you need to be ready. We also learned that nothing equals working hard for the membership, but even that does not automatically win leadership positions at election time, but it does earn you credibility with your members. In closing, I'd like to stress two important items we've learned and are still learning. That is the importance of meeting with each other and talking and making the time to do this. We all bring a unique perspective, and this is crucial to analyzing, planning, and strategizing. Lastly, when you're in for the long haul, respecting each other's friendships and having fun together is crucial. When the going gets tough, you need to be able to laugh about it. You need to be able to dust yourself off and each other off and get back in the fight for your members, your union, and your labor community. And I just want to end off by saying that remember that solidarity is a, is a renewable resource.